And so I realized, okay, that's actually really a good idea just to do in general. Dress for the job you want, right? So m- maybe you've never spoken on stage before. What can you put together that would show people what what you're like, how professional you are? And have a, sp- a page like that on your site. And that's a page you can send people to. And as you start to get speaking gigs, see if you can record parts of those and you can put those on your site as well. And that's just, that's a good start. And maybe put together a, a mock presentation of a couple of a couple of slides. And just, even if you're not a professional speaker, pretend that you're a professional speaker. We talk about it all the time, right? Fake it until you make it. And amazing things can happen. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 382 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Maddie Dalrymple and Michael Aron, authors of the new book that you have been hearing about uh, on this podcast for the past several weeks in the sponsor portion of this podcast. I said podcast twice, didn't I? Oh, well, what are you going to do? I'm not going to edit that. (laughs) But the book I'm talking about is From Page to Platform, How to Succeed as an author speaker and it is such a fantastic conversation Uh, you'll have the conversation will also be in the show notes just the interview itself uh, which is a a link to the video on youtube which i had shared previously as a a special preview for my awesome patrons but you're going to get the full episode the full slightly edited interview because i do actually edit the audio of the interviews i cut some of our ums and things like that to make us sound good and i kind of adjust things when when I accidentally end up speaking over somebody, etc. But anyways, <laughs> that episode, fantastic conversation with Maddie and Michael, is coming up later in this episode. But first, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. And oh, well, it would be really redundant to have the sponsor, you know, be page to platform when we're talking about that in the main content. So let's, let's, um, let's do a different sponsor that's still somewhat related and pay attention to see how it's related. This episode is sponsored by this year's Writing Tools Story Bundle, which is curated by best-selling author and publisher, Kevin J. Anderson. Now, this story bundle is another treasure chest of vital handbooks covering aspects of the writer's craft, of the business, and the writer's way of life. There's 13 titles on a range of subjects, plus a 12-month subscription to Indie Author Magazine, your best source to stay up to date on the indie side of the book industry. Now, the way that Story Bundle works is you pay what you want for four of these books. I'll list them just in a second. But if you pay $20 or more, you get the entire set, including five books that are exclusive to this bundle. And also a portion of the bundle goes to a very good cause, which you can read about on the website storybundle.com. Now, included in this writing bundle are books from authors you might recognize from previous episodes of this podcast, like Todd Fonestock, Falling to Fly, He was in episode 362 and episode 340. Carrie Flanagan, who has two books in the set, and and she was in episodes 299, 209, 117, 45, and 31. Kevin J. Anderson, who is hosting this particular bundle. And uh, Kevin, although he's been mentioned in many other episodes, uh, was a guest on episode 357 and 130. Uh, Joshua Esso, who is a guest on episodes 260 and 137. And of course, today's episode guests, Michael Laron, uh, who was in episode 279, and Maddie Dalrymple, who was in episodes, hang on, I gotta take a deep breath. Maddie was in episodes 300, 
258, 245, 236, 231, 226, 216, and 116, and probably was mentioned in a bunch of other episodes, but those are the ones where she was speakered, featured as an actual speaker, and you get to hear her voice. Now, whew, there, I'm taking another breath. I think Carrie and Maddie apparently are in a competition for the most repeated guest on the podcast. So, so answer me this in the comments at starkreflections.ca. Do we need a Stark guest smackdown? Right for the person who's uh, has been in in it the most, and and uh, I don't know, maybe we'll come up with something fun. But that's an aside. Let me get back to the proper ad read. Now, this bundle, this bundle also includes a fifteen thousand word sneak peek version of my forthcoming book, A Writer's Guide to Branding for Success, which is coming in the spring of two thousand twenty five. Now, this book is a sneak peek, and it comes with a link where you'll be able to get the full book before it's available for retail sale. So don't worry, you're not just getting the sneak peek. You're getting the sneak peek now ahead of everyone else, and then you will get the full book prior to its spring 2025 release. I just have to slow down and find some time to get some of these books actually finished. (laughs) Now, if you're interested in this story bundle, you can find it at storybundle.com. But do not delay. I am recording this on October 4th, 2024, but it's only going to be available for a limited time. So if you're listening to this too far, you know, a month or so in the future, you're not going to be able to take advantage of it. But do check it out over at storybundle.com. There's a full write-up with details about all of the book's reviews, sneak peeks, teasers. You can get a, a sample of what's in each of those books. And, oh, oh, wait, there's more patrons of this podcast wait till the end of this episode and you can find out how you, yes, you, dear patron, can get access to a special draw for uh, four of the books from this bundle. I have three of those available, and that includes the book Dollar by Dollar by Carrie Flanagan, Booking the Library by Jessica Bronner. Oh, I'm looking forward to reading that one because I have not yet read that one. Esso's Guides to Writing, Mood and Atmosphere by Joshua Esso. Romance Character Tropes by Tara Grace Erickson and Jessica Barber. And again, this story bundle for writers is only available for a limited time, so do not delay. You can find it over at storybundle.com. And now for comments from recent episodes. Over on Twitter slash X, Edwin Downward said... Working on fitting in podcasts in my presently confused days. And then again, Edwin, uh, I'm so thankful that I managed to stay on the list of podcasts that you're on. Anyways, okay, continue this. Uh, I finally got to last week's Stark Reflections with Mark Leslie. This episode, I'm reminded of the lightning rod metaphor in which we never know which outreach will attract the right attention and give our work a boost. And it is so true. I think I remember Kevin Anderson saying this once on a panel, and it kind of stuck with me as, you know, the more lightning rods I plant, <laughs> the more lightning tends to strike. And again, you don't know which one is, is going to work. So so thank you. Thank you for that comment and that reference to that uh, to that metaphor. Uh, Edwin, appreciate your comments. And then over on, where did I get this? Oh, I got this on starkreflections.ca for episode 379, Simplify Your Life and Work with Dre Baldwin. Maddie Dalrymple, hey, I know Maddie, she's going to be a guest on this episode. (laughs) Maddie Dalrymple said, and Maddie, oh my God, if only I had this in your voice, then that would rank you up to another, you know, sort of feature episode. But I already have your voice in this episode. So what am I saying? Anyways, back to the comment. Maddie said, so much to say. First, thank you so much for the shout out for From Page to Platform. And thank you again for cramming the writing of the forward into your unbelievably busy schedule. Also, it cracked me up when you said you had been doing the podcast for only seven years, not missing a week. I was also interested in hearing that the podcast is still a labor of love for you rather than a significant source of income, if I understood your comments correctly, which is a sobering but important message for newer podcasters and those thinking of starting a podcast to hear. And I'm going to pause uh, again and just comment on that, Maddie, is No, it's true. It's a labor of love. Sure, I bring in income from this podcast, but I would make more money going to McDonald's uh, for the hours that I spend in terms of you know, working for minimum wage and I mean, and then sneaking some fries every once in a while. But I, I would earn more having a 
whatever job at a fast food place rather than the podcast. But the podcast is so important to me and it's that importance and it's the sense of community that I get from my listeners that make it so worthwhile. So yes, there is money that comes in. Thanks to my awesome patrons and thanks to the uh, sponsorships I get, which are a little bit more sporadic now. I used to have a steady sponsor, but that's sort of evolved and changed over time. But that's that's cool. That's fine. I actually like changing up the sponsors that I have. So I am getting money for the podcast, but money is not the primary thing. Anyway, so that, again, is a long aside. Back to Maddie's comment. <laughs> During your personal update, when you said you shared the unedited interviews with your patrons, I thought, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that too. I was still thinking through the logistical details, such as how I would ensure guests knew the content was going to be used in this way and how I would deal with having a guest decline to have unedited video shared when I started listening to Dre's fantastic thoughts on the importance of simplification. I quickly discarded the idea of adding this very cool task to my to to do list. And that's a really important reflection. So thanks for sharing that, Maddie. You got an idea and you're like, whoa, this is just getting too complicated. And and that's a great decision that we have to make. And uh, at the end, the last part of Maddie's comment is I'm bookmarking this episode and committing to listening to it every quarter when I revisit my quarterly and yearly plans for my writing and publishing work. Thanks to you, Andre, for a fantastic conversation. And thank you, Maddie, for that in-depth, insightful comment. It's great to hear from you. Great to hear what you're thinking. But I know, I know I'm going to hear more about what you're thinking when uh, when I get to share the interview with you and Michael. And I just a reminder to my listeners, you can leave comments like Maddie did over at starkreflections.ca. You can at me on the various online social medias things. And you can also leave comments over at youtube.com slash Mark Leslie Lefebvre because, I mean, who doesn't want to sp spell all that and, and exhaust your fingers on the keyboard just to get there? But that's where that's where the audio-only portions of this episode are posted. But, of course, there'll also be the YouTube uh, video of just the interview uh, portion of, of this episode that'll be there. But anyways, I do appreciate your comments and your thoughts and what you're thinking about and in particular, what you're reflecting on and what you're learning and how that's affecting your writing life and your plans in your writing world. That just reminds me of the value that we have in this back and forth conversation, part of this wonderful community of of uh, of y'all because because i love y'all look I'm, I'm speaking southern again i can see i can adapt very quickly but anyways that's it for the comments i'm gonna roll the bumper and get into a personal update for a personal update i released the book this week i released one hand screaming finally it came out officially on october 1st and it uh, we did a, a a book and beer launch one hand screaming and one hop screaming we did on uh, Wednesday, October 2nd at Counterpoint Brewing in Kitchener, and it was so lovely. I had, it was pretty much, it was a smaller space, so it was pretty much a packed house. We probably could have fit another five or ten people in there, but basically the whole place was full. There were lots of amazing folks there. I, I tried my best to get around to talk to everyone because I, I wanted to say hi and thank you, and, and, and there were some regulars at the bar as well who hadn't heard of him. I mean, most people have never heard of me, but the regulars who hadn't heard of me, they were there and they ended up uh, buying a book as well. And it was just such a wonderful collaboration. And I was so thrilled at how delicious the beer tasted. It had a, a very bitter, it's got some grapefruit essence to it, like that fruity aroma and it's hazy. And uh, I just, I, I loved it. And, and I was, I was worried, right? Obviously. Uh, so when Graham poured me that first draft, uh, it was delicious. I did a little bit of a talk, a little a uh, little bit of a talk. I actually talk a little bit about what I shared uh, at, at the event on a, on a YouTube video that I'll also link to in this post because I do talk about that collaboration. But I'm going to cut off my personal update for now because what I'm doing because I'm traveling so much this month is I'm going to record a special episode for everyone, not just for patrons. I'm going to record a special episode talking about this collaboration, how how I'm leveraging it to market myself, some of the various aspects and intricacies of it, and maybe give you some ideas on how you can leverage similar 
uh, similar collaborations with other businesses. I'm not talking it, that it has to be a beer, but there are other businesses where your your interests may align. And, and I want to prompt you to think about those things. But that's it for my personal update. I'm going to roll the bumper and we're going to have a wonderful conversation. Well, I mean, I'm going to have a wonderful conversation, but you'll be privy to the wonderful conversation that I have with Maddie and with Michael talking about their new book, From Page to Platform. Maddie, Michael, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. It is lovely to be here. Yeah, it's great to be here, Mark. It's great. To, it's always great to chat with, with you guys. And I get I get both of you at the same time. So that's even awesome. It's like a double bang for the buck. And we're going to talk <laughs> about we're going to talk about you two collaborating to bring some greatness, uh, combined greatness to the world. But before we get into that, uh, let's dig into your backgrounds as, as, as writers in general and and, and you know, lead into how we got to this project. I'll start with you, Maddie. Well, I am Maddie Dalrymple. I write the Anne Kinnear suspense novels and suspense shorts in the Lizzie Ballard thrillers. And I also write, speak, podcast, and consult on the writing craft and the publishing voyage as the indie author. And I serve as the campaigns manager for the Alliance of Independent Authors. And I started my uh, writing and publishing journey in 2013 with the first Anne Kinnear novel, The Sense of Death. Wow. Wow. So b before uh, before that first novel, were you writing before that? Was it always a dream or was it something that you, you know, that, that sort of came upon you <laughs> around that time? <laughs> well, it was always a dream because my father was a writer. My father was primarily a, a short fiction writer and he got some stories published back in the day in Collier's and Cosmopolitan when magazines like that often published short fiction. And so I did some writing. I took some creative writing courses in college, and um, I got at least one story published in a periodical. It was great because my dad was my agent. And so all I had to do was write the stories, give them to him, and then he took care of it. Oh my God, I never fantastic. had to see the rejections. Yeah, it was great. I only got to see the acceptances. Um, but then I kind of set it aside for many, many years because I just didn't have an idea. I knew I wanted to write novel-length works, and I didn't have an idea that I really felt supported an entire uh, novel length of story until 2011, when my husband and I were vacationing at the um, Yellowstone Inn, the lovely historic Yellowstone Inn. And I started telling him a story I had in my mind about a woman who can communicate with the dead. And that was where the Anne Kinnear stories came from. And if you're ever going to write a spooky story, then the Yellowstone Inn is the place to get inspired by it. Well, that sounds fun. And is it true, uh, your, your publishing imprint, um, actually, is that in honor of your father? Yes, my publishing imprint is William Kingsfield Publishers, and it is named after the pen name that my father used, William Kingsfield. Ah, very my cool. homage to my dad. I love that. I love that. That is so cool. All right, Michael, where 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 did it all start for you, sir? Uh, I don't know if I can top that, but um, I I my name is Michael Aran, and I I'm the author of over uh, close to a hundred science fiction, fantasy, self help books for writers, and um, I have a YouTube channel. It's called Author Level Up, and I publish writing videos with writing advice and all that fun stuff that uh, writers enjoy to help them become the best versions of themselves. And uh, like Maddie, I also work at the Alliance of Independent Authors. I'm the outreach manager. And so uh, responsible for bringing in new, new people into the organization who should know about Ally. And uh, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Cool. I, I love that. I love that you're both doing stuff for Ally. It was such a great group doing so many great things for writers. So uh, how did, how did you get into uh, the, the writing realm? Yeah, I, I had a um, I had a near death experience in 2012, and up until that point, I'd been a sometime writer. Like I, I hadn't really written anything that serious. I tried to get some stuff out to literary agents, but it didn't work out. And um, I kind of realized at that point that that life was too short, and um, published my first book in 2014. And fast forward, here I am. Wow. And and as I understand it, you actually are also a very busy person with multiple things on the go. And you do a lot of you, you most of your novels are written with the thumbs, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm 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 a little busy. I have a I guess a few things I have going on. I mean, I've got <laughs> a full time job, um, a wife, a daughter, rabbit, turtle. Do you know? Oh, do they race the two of them? No, they don't race, unfortunately. But okay. um, yeah, yeah, but they do have some interesting conversations. But um, yeah, and and I and I, I managed to to kind of do all that, and even attend law school classes in the evenings, and 
all that. Because yeah, you and, don't and have writing, enough going on, right? Because I don't have enough. And and like you said, I've learned how to write on my phone and I, I do a lot of dictating and it's fun. Ah, good stuff. Good stuff. So, so did, I'm, I'm curious about how you guys met. Did you guys meet? I mean, I know you know each other through the author community. Was, was it that, was it through the Alliance of Independent Authors? Was it, was it somewhere where one of you was doing a presentation or a talk? Well, Michael, I know that we got the idea for uh, collaborating at a Writer's Digest conference. We were both presenting separately um, and uh, but knew each other from somewhere. And now I can't remember the somewhere, but we had gotten together for dinner to chat about stuff. Do you remember where that originated? I do remember. And it's funny because it's kind of a, it's one of those weird, weird things of, of history. So Dale L. Roberts introduced us. Okay. I think That's Dale right. was on your podcast and Dale introduced me. And um, he sent a nice email connecting the both of us. And somehow that ended up in my spam filter. And I remember seeing it and then I didn't get a chance to respond to it. And so I was like, oh yeah, I'd love to respond. And then I went off and did something. And then my spam filter took it. And then like a couple of weeks later, maybe it was maybe a month later, I was like, oh wait, I, never, I don't think I ever responded to Maddie. And so then I went, I had to go dig into my spam filter and reply to your email. And then we connected <laughs> and- I think I was on your show maybe one or two times before we officially met in New York. Yeah. And then we hit it off famously. And then we were over dinner one night and we were talking about speaking and trading speaking war stories. And the idea of the book was born. So, okay, this I want to I want to get into there's a few things I want to explore here. Dale Roberts, great guy, uh, what Seth Godin would call a linchpin. Dale really loves introducing people. That's that's one one of the things I love. I love so many things about him, but that's one of the things I love about him is he connects really cool people to each other and then magic happens. Yeah. He's um, like the creative matchmaker of the, of the yes, author community. Is. Yeah. So in New York at the writer's digest conference, you were both, you had met online, you had had discussions, either uh, podcast interviews or, or whatever had met, but had never met in person. I, I really want to dig into the, how did the idea come up? Because I've, I've had book ideas where I'm, I'm hanging out with someone at a conference and we're having a few drinks and all of a sudden, bam. <laughs> so is it, was there any sort of particular spark or was it just sort of a natural progression in the conversation? I think it was the conversation just about our experience in getting to the conference. You know, what okay. uh, what were our best practices in terms of pursuing speaking engagements? What pitfalls had we uh, either stumbled into and gotten out of or avoided? And, you know, what experiences were we looking for? Um, and just a conversation about that. And then at the end of the, uh, Mark, this is reminding me a little bit about how our co-authored book came about. But at the end of that dinner, we both sort of said, um, man, we have a lot of information here we could share with people. <laughs> yeah yeah i i think you know when speakers naturally meet out in the wild i think they inevitably talk about speaking and i right. think it just kind of came up and we were talking about it and it just it was a topic that we were both really passionate about and we could tell and yeah and the next thing i don't, I don't know maddie it was probably what two weeks later we had a very detailed and comprehensive outline <laughs> of everything we wanted to write about yeah so it yeah. was Fodder, getting the fodder time. was no problem. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. Awesome. Cool. So from page to platform, uh, how to succeed as an author speaker is the title of the book. It is already available everywhere you can find awesome books, right? Yes. And uh, so let's let's talk a little bit uh, about the process uh, for you guys. So you you had the, the the idea you were talking together and then a couple of weeks later you had everything sort of mapped out and planned out on on how this was going to release how did you go about writing it was it dictation was it uh, handwriting like how did you divide up the chapters etc yeah michael do you want to start with that one sure so so we we each had a few chapters that we were passionate about so i i don't remember how we divided it up it was you know, Maddie would take these chapters, I would take those chapters, and we wrote them separately. And then once they were all written, we kind of combined them all together. And Maddie took the lead on that because Maddie is way more organized and, and detail oriented than I think I'll ever be. And um, we had a comment system and we combined it all together and then we would trade the manuscript back and forth. And, and to use Maddie's um, flying metaphor, uh, Maddie would have the plane for a few weeks and then she would give the plane back to me and then we trade the planes back and forth and had comments with each other and um, slow, slowly but surely it, it, it came into place. 
<laughs> Did I miss anything, Maddie? No, just that I anticipate a future book in our collaboration uh, series yes. on co-authoring because we learned a ton. Um, I think that the, <laughs> yes, the creative part was never a challenge, but the the logistics could be very challenging. Uh, yeah. There just isn't good software out there, I don't believe, to, uh, to do co-writing the same document at the same time, which is what led to this... Um, this passing back and forth and the, and the analogy, normally I go for the boat analogy, but because I took flying lessons for several years, ah. uh, I love this plane analogy, which is that if, if you're at the controls and you want to pass the controls to someone, uh, you'll say you have the plane or they'll say, I have the plane. And then you have to do this awkward, you have the plane, I have the plane back and forth. You're supposed to do it three times. What my flight instructor called the awkward exchange of control. <laughs> But it is it it is super important to say, okay, you're working on the master. I, I have my hands off, so you don't end up stepping on each other. I love that. So you have the manuscript. I have the manuscript. You have the manuscript. Okay, we're exactly. Good. <laughs> you must yeah, have taken yeah. a flying lesson at some point because that's exactly <laughs> it. <laughs> uh, no, you're a good instructor. I learned right from what you just told me. So there so, you go. So okay, so so let's get into this. Why why then would an author want to? want to i mean come on a lot of authors are introverts they're like they prefer to hide behind the 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 keyboard the the pen the 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 microphone whatever it is and and do their creative work in in in, in private or in quiet or in solitude so what's the benefit of an author uh be being a speaker well in in all the books that i've had a part in i always feel like understanding one's goals is very important and the goals can be different like we describe sort of a host of goals that people might have and then talk about our own i know for myself my goal was to get my name out there earn some money as another stream of income of my writing and publishing business adding speakers fees to that stream of income networking i think those were my my primary goals and so that was what attracted me to it and then i formed the plan i developed in order to pursue those specific to those goals yeah, and we have a section in the book about the speaking goals and 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 fleshing that out more. I think the the one of the re main reasons I got into it was it just it just helped me stand out. I, I I enjoyed, you know, up until becoming a writer, I I took public speaking classes and and all that, and I enjoyed being on stage despite being a textbook introvert. And I found that that I was pretty good at it, and I found that people asked me to come speak and do different things, and so I. It was a skill that I already had that I just wanted to develop. And it's a skill that made me stand out because, Mark, as you pointed to, a lot of writers are introverts. And so it's typically expected for most people to, to not want to get up on a stage. And right. so if you're one of those rare creatures with uh, with some sort of weird brain disease like Maddie and I have where we, we don't mind getting up on stage, then <laughs> that makes you stand out. And right. it, it, it leads to opportunities and opens doors that you couldn't even dream of. And so that's another reason. Okay. I, I often said, so it's kind of funny. I, I'm way more comfortable on a stage than I am walking into a room and having to strike up conversation with people, even people I know, because <laughs> I can find it overwhelming because I know, like, so for example, I might see Maddie's over there and Michael's over there and some other person I know is there and some other per person I know is there. I walk in, I go, I don't know who I should go talk to. I have this social uncomfortableness of, well, if I go and talk to this person, but not that person, I've insulted them. And then, and I get this anxiety, but when I'm on stage, my goal is to provide value for the audience. And I usually know what the topic is. Usually when you're doing a talk, there's a specific content that you want to deliver and value you want to give. But also I think, I think one of the things I recognized as well is, we're storytellers. We we love telling stories, whether it's the fictional stuff that we write or or as 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 a as an orator on stage, you, you're you're trying to you're telling a story in in some way. Is that true? Yeah, for sure. I think the storytelling aspect is the is the key strength that writers bring to a speaking career. But I also think that Mark, you're excellent at this. That another key aspect is making it a conversation. And I've seen you speak. Uh, you know, to large groups of people, but it always feels like a conversation. And being able to engage with people, you know, if, if you're speaking to a group of five people, you're speaking to a group of 500 people, being able to have each of those people feel like they're having a conversation with you is is a real key to success in addition to the storytelling aspect. So, all right. 
how does a writer how does a writer work i mean if it's in their goals if it's something that that, that they that they want to do how does a writer get from page to stage what what are some of the strategies that you would advise uh to to writers in terms of i mean uh, i guess i think we've kind of covered why one might want to do it but 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 it's also uh, so michael you talked about uh reach right you stood out i remember 20 books to 50k years ago uh i think it was the first time i had ever heard of you uh or seen you and you were on stage and the minute you got up there and opened your mouth and started talking i just fell in love i was just held in awe of this magnificent speaker who basically had the whole room in the palm of his hands and i was like I got to talk to this guy. This guy's really cool. Uh, and of course, I've, I've then recommended you to other conferences and, and and stuff like that. But let's, so is th that's one of the whys, right? You stand out and suddenly you're, you're known where, you know, I had never heard of you before, uh, which is the case for most of us. We're, we're, we're unknown to most of the world. <laughs> right? But what, what are some, of, I guess, some of the other reasons to do it? And then some of the strategies that you guys may want to advise authors if they think that's something they want to try out. Yeah, well, well thank you for the kind words, Mark. And and 20 Books was one of the first speaking events that I had. It was certainly really? the largest speaking event that I had up, in, up until that point. And, and that was like 800 or 900 people in that room. It was I, a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a lot of people. It was, <laughs> it was like, shaking in your boots on the stage <laughs> before they call your name kind of people. But but yeah, if, if you want to do it, what I always recommend, and, and honestly, uh, this is what I did to get that gig, dress for the job that you want. And that's kind of a cliche. But there happened to be an opportunity, Craig Martell posted that they were looking for people. This is back when you when he did that, they don't do that anymore. They didn't do it near the end. But I, I was like, oh, well, that would be kind of a cool opportunity. I think that would be nice. And so what I did is I put together a page on my site and I put together a like a like a speaker's reel, like a video. It was a cut of all my best moments on my YouTube channel that would show what it would look like if I were to be a speaker. And then I put in my bio and I put in topics that I could speak about and I made the page as professional as possible. And I sent that to Craig and Craig was like, you're in. Good luck. <laughs> and so, and so I realized, okay, that's, that's kind of, that's actually really a good idea just to do in general, dress for the job you want, right? So maybe you've never spoken on stage before. What can you put together that would show people what, what you're like, how professional you are and have a state, a page like that on your site. And that's a page you can send people to. And as you start to get speaking gigs, see if you can record parts of those and you can put those on your site as well. And that's just, that's a good start and maybe put together a, a mock presentation of a couple of, a couple of slides. And just, even if you're not a professional speaker, pretend that you're a professional speaker. We talk about it all the time, right? <laughs> Fake it until you make it. Right. And amazing things can happen. I think the other thing I'd add is that for people who aren't quite as willing to jump into the deep end as you were presenting to hundreds and hundreds of people at 20 books, um, there's sort of a progression you can work through. If you're uncomfortable, if you like the idea of being an author speaker, but you're kind of uncomfortable about it, things like starting with podcast interviews can be a good entree because, you know, here I am, I can think that mm. it's just me chatting with Michael and Mark. And um, <laughs> I, I don't have to worry about the uh, number of people who are going to be watching this later on or listening to this later on. And so it can be a more comfortable entree at the same time when you're, you have to kind of trick your brain two ways. One is that, oh, it's just me chatting with, with a host or with two other people. And you have to realize that it is, in fact, something that is going to be going out to hundreds of people, thousands of people. And so you have to bring the same level of professionalism, regardless of the format, regardless of whether it's live or recorded, regardless of all those other things. But it can just bring an emotional sense of comfort to start with an audience of, it seems like, two when you're doing it. <laughs> I like that. And, and and of course, you both have uh, podcasts, YouTube channels, etc. as well. So you you guys have, well, I mean, you, you do both, right? Obviously, you do stage stuff. But did it did start with, uh, Michael, you had mentioned YouTube and Maddie, it, it started with your podcast before you did your first in person speaking, right? Well, I had done small speaking engagements, you know, smaller scale speaking engagements early on okay. to like local writers groups and things like that. Okay. And I had had a certain amount of speaking experience from my 
uh, previous life in the corporate world. And so that was something that wasn't um, unfamiliar to me, uh, even when I started, you know, I had that basis to go on and then pitch myself for um, bigger, more prestigious um, in-person, large audience speaking engagements. Cool. Um, I, I may, well, go ahead, Michael. Looks like you were going to say, add something. I, I was going to add the same thing that I had done a couple of, well, like Maddie, I had done a couple of things on stage right. and I was fairly comfortable being on a stage and that, that helped the transition into being an author speaker. Okay. So, and when talking about the pitch earlier, Michael, you had, you had talked about, you know, I put together a page and here are some topics I could speak of. And one of the, one of the sections in your book uh, is the types of talks and it's not the usual suspects. Can you guys elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. There's, 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 a, a, a few different types of, of, of talks and, and Maddie, you tell me if I forget one, cause I, I know I'm going to forget, forget a few, but the, 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 the type of talk that most people would, would be doing if you're going to be an author speaker would be just your typical presentation where you're, you're up on stage, you give the information, people can ask questions if they want. That's typically what people think of classically when they think of speaking, but there are also other types of speaking events as well. And, and some that could be easier to break into, like for example, panels. So you could be on a panel with other people and that takes the pressure off of you to not be the one speaking all the time. Now there are some panel etiquette do's and don'ts that we talk about in the, in the book that Maddie and I were laughing about as we, as we wrote it, because we've both been on panels that have been for lack of a better word, dumpster fires. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so there's a right way and a wrong way to do a panel, but, uh, those are great ways to break in. And, and then there's other events like author readings. Maddie is really good at those. And, um, and then there's also other events like uh, keynotes and things like that. But those are the three major ones. Maddie, did I miss any? No, I think you hit them all. And I think author readings is a great one to highlight because that's something that a lot of uh, writers have an opportunity to do pretty early in their careers, especially if they're connecting with their local um, writers groups. And uh, those often, often offer opportunities to do that kind of thing. And it's important. It's it's an entree, but it's also important, again, to bring the same level of professionalism. This is a theme that Michael and I hit in the book over and over again, that uh, if, if people leave with nothing else, it's the importance of maintaining a sense of professionalism throughout. And it can be a really good learning uh, opportunity to do author readings because it illustrates for you the importance of complying with the guidelines and sticking to a, a time limit and providing the information that the organizer needs when they need it and how they need it. And um, showing up for the first speaker and staying until the last speaker because there's nothing worse as a speaker late in the evening to see people gradually trickling out of the room. Um, so yeah, author readings, I think is, is something that people can really take advantage of and, do, and gain a lot of learnings from. Cool. Yeah. It's funny. I'm, I'm actually, uh, when we finish this interview, I'm off to go do one at a local radio station in studio, hour long program cool. with two other authors where we each get 10 minutes. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's kind of like, I haven't done one of those in a long time, pre pandemic <laughs> in person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. So uh, you guys mentioned panels, and I think it, it's probably worth getting into this because I can imagine that anyone who's listening to this who thinks, okay, that's kind of scary doing a keynote, doing a full hour presentation, just me. I'm not ready for that. Panels is a really great gateway into getting up there, getting in front of people, but you're having a conversation usually with two or three potentially more uh, other people. Let's, can you guys each share potentially one or one or two uh, do's or don'ts? <laughs> Those are favorite things that you, it's like, oh, I just wish authors knew not to do this or to do that. Uh, Cause I've also, I've been uh, unfortunately been involved in dumpster fire panels and I've also witnessed a really painful panels that uh, did not deliver. Michael, do you want to start that one? Yeah, sure. I'll start. So I, I'll give a do and I'll give a don't. Uh, a do would be to keep your responses as concise as possible. Okay. Don't be the mic hog. But, you know, you don't want to be the 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 EF Hutton either. You know, you say one sentence and then you pass the <laughs> microphone over. You, you, you want to give people some, some content here. And it, it also helps to not try not to say the word, oh, I agree with everything the other panelists have said. 
Just try to avoid that because everybody says that. That's like the the stock response. Just say what you need to say. Don't say I agree with everything that's been said. And I, I have been guilty of that myself. So that's that's the do is is focus and, and even practice on having a very concise answer, especially if you can get the questions ahead of time. You don't always, but sometimes right. you can. But practice a one minute answer, being able to answer things in one minute. Okay. The second like or the 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 don't, um, the, the the don't I would would offer is don't hide. You know, the, the, there's there's often panels where there's a lot of people on the panel, or panels where there's just a couple, and then you have a mic hog, and you've got somebody that is capitalizing all of the time. And sometimes I find myself, hey, I, I really want to know what that. What, what the person on the end has to say, they haven't really spoken very much, but when they spoke, I really enjoyed what they had to say. So don't, don't hide on a panel. You know, be, don't be afraid to give your opinion. Don't be afraid to disagree with other people on the panel, because that makes the panel more valuable okay. when you have dissenting opinions. And I think sometimes people are afraid to be disagreeable on a panel, but actually the participants love that because that's why they're there. They're, they're there to get different perspectives. Yeah, they're there to see a conversation, a dynamic conversation, not just a bunch of, so what should you do? Oh, you should do this. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. Okay, next question. <laughs> yeah, fair <laughs> yeah. enough. Yeah, that's not very fun. Okay. Yeah, I would add from a, I'll take this question from a moderator point of view, because okay. I think that if people uh, understand this, they can not only weigh whether moderation is right for them, because sometimes that is on offer as well, but they can sometimes act informally as a moderator, even if they're a panelist. So I generally only sit on panels when I'm invited. If there's a, a moderator who's, that's their that's their whole job. They're just there to be a moderator. And if you're thinking about being a moderator, you have to consider that because in my opinion, moderators should not be promoting their own work. They should be focused specifically on helping the panelists give the best performance they can. So it's sort of like the most thankless job you can accept in the speaker uh, portfolio is being a moderator. Uh, also things like don't be the moderator who starts with seat one and then goes down the row. And then with the second question starts with seat one and goes down the row. And then with question three starts with seat one and goes down the row because the person at the end of the row is always going to have nothing to say other than what they said. Um, you know, vary who you're uh, throwing the questions out to. Also recognize if uh, you as a panelist or you as a moderator have control over how many people are on the panel, like I generally don't accept panel invitations if they're more than maybe four panelists, because okay. there's just not enough time for each panelist to give meaty answers to the questions. And as a moderator, I always, if I know the panelists, I always throw the first question out to the person who either I know is going to answer in the way that Michael described, a, a concise, interesting answer that doesn't sound robotic or um they're not thrashing around about it. Or if I don't know them, I prep them in advance. Like I'm going to throw the first question to you and I'm expecting the answer is going to be about one minute long. Um, so those are tips if you're a moderator. And then if you're not a moderator, sometimes you can almost work your way. If the, if the moderator isn't stepping up as a panelist, you can sometimes step up for them and help control the dynamics of the situation to make it as good as possible for the audience and the other panelists. It could that be, uh, so I've seen and, and done this, uh, for example, Michael had mentioned uh, there's the person on the end who's, who said one thing and it, there's been a Mike Hogg who's kind of taken over and maybe the moderator isn't experienced enough to be able to get control back. I've actually, as a panelist, pointedly said, I'd love to hear what so-and-so has to say about this. <laughs> I mean, which yeah. is, it seems kind of very, yeah. you know, like not, not a writer thing to do, not an introvert thing to do, but, but it's kind of like, no, that, that person did have something interesting to say. I'm curious what, what their opinion is, you know, rather than babble mouth over here. <laughs> yeah. No, I wouldn't say it that way, of course, but <laughs> it's a, you would, you would think, but not say out loud the babble mouth part, yes. but yeah, you're serving <laughs> the audience. You're, you're serving the people who have come to the panel to make sure they get the experience that they signed up for. Cool. Um, one of the things that I've seen recently is I saw a panelist um, spend the first 10 minutes reading the bios of everyone on the panel. Then I'm pretty sure that most of the people who showed up at the panel know who the people are, or at least one, at least one of the people on the panel, they kind of know enough about them that they wanted to see it. So uh, is that sort of bad moderation etiquette where you just like, oh, let's waste the first 10 minutes telling you something you already know? <laughs> 
Well, I think so. And it, that actually suggests another thing to me which, that we talk about in the book, which is the different types of bios. And I actually just experienced this, not on a panel, but in a presentation that I was uh, speaking at a conference and I'd sent them two bios. One was the, here's my big, long bio to convince you that you should bring me in as a speaker. And then my intro bio, you know, at, at the at the start. And um, I was, there was a woman there who was responsible for introducing this speaker. She, she started through the bio and I finally realized that she was about to read my entire speaker application bio. And I just said, you know, you can stop. Nobody needs to, nobody needs that much information <laughs> about me. But yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, Mark, you as using the word wasting the time uh, illustrates exactly why you don't want to be doing that. Michael, what do you think about that? Oh, I, I, I agree. I, I, there have definitely been some panels where I, I think you you alluded to this, Maddie, where or in Mark, you did the two where the the moderator's just not experienced enough. Sometimes um, I've been in panels where there is no moderator, and that is something as a speaker, I I have be I've be started to begin asking for moderators <laughs> or or asking you know get huddling with the panelists to say hey who's going to take the lead on this because sometimes that can just be a recipe for disaster too. Yeah. I've even seen panels that didn't actually have a, a moderator. And what I tend to do is I usually tend to take control because one of the things I look at is, okay, what are we here to do? Let's make sure we give them what they have. And, and that's where you sort of take on the role of moderator, even though you're a panelist. So you do have things to contribute, but I usually, when I take that role, I do default back to the, I'm going to speak the least. I'm going to throw out questions. I'm going to, Pick on uh, pick on people in the audience who have questions to ask these wonderful people, uh, and I'm going to keep my answers even shorter, <laughs> so I'm not monopolizing the time. I, I think that sometimes happens naturally on those panels that's that are moderator less. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and knowing that ahead of time, I mean, another tip is make sure you understand what you're stepping into, yeah, uh, before you get there, because if the organizer has sent out the word to the five panelists or whatever, and it's clear there's not a moderator, or you've clarified that with the organizer that there's not going to be, then you have that time in advance. I, I've done this as well, or, you know, participated with other panelists who are doing this and saying, um, okay, let's agree ahead of time. Um, we're, we're going to, you know, on question number one, this person's going to answer first on question number two, this person's going to answer first on question number three, this person's going to answer first. Let's all keep our answers to about this length. Like you can do that if you know in advance, it's when yeah. you, you show up and there is no moderator or there's de facto no moderator because the person is inexperienced in that role, but it's a problem. Yeah. So, okay. So let's get into, uh, thank you guys. This is, uh, so such incredible content that uh, as I'm thinking, like, I want to send this to <laughs> to everyone who does panels at conferences, <laughs> uh, organizes them. Uh, okay, so uh, finding uh, and assessing the opportunities is also one of the topics that you cover. Um, so, okay, all right, I have this idea, I have these goals, I have this ambition, I have these books, I have this content, this podcast, this YouTube video, whatever that I want to share with people. How does a writer go about finding those opportunities and 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 and, and whether or not it's worth it in some cases. Michael, do you want to take that one? Yeah. So so first things first is what are all of the major events in your niche? Right? So where where are all of the events at virtually and physically? That's public enemy number 1. Figure out what all the events in your niche are and then figure out what your angle is. Right. So is there a particular talk that you can give regarding your book? Is there something you're passionate about? And then figure out what it would take to get into each of those venues. Maybe some of some of the events have a, a application process that opens up from October to January. Right. Maybe some they, they want you to reach out to the organizer, figure out what that is and then go about it and make essentially a very, very short pitch. Right. So keep, keep, you know, keep your pitch to a paragraph, two paragraphs, keep it very, very simple, explain what value you have to offer, what, what you could teach and let the chips fall where they may. But I think the, the, the art of the pitch is the most important part. I think it's what people get wrong. First, either they don't pitch or they over pitch, they oversell it. They, they send an organizer 10,000 paragraphs of what they want to, to speak about. 
not realizing that organizers are some of the busiest people on the planet. They don't have a whole lot of time. So you've got just a very narrow window to be able to catch their attention. Right. And that's how you, that's how you do it. Okay. Yeah. I think that that's, that's a good uh, point going back to Michael, what you'd said earlier about having that page where you'd posted the uh, best excerpts from your speaking engagements that if you can send an organizer an email that, that says, you know, I've looked over what you want to, what uh, this conference is about. I think I understand what you, what value you want to offer to the attendees. I think this, these three presentations um, would be a great fit and click the link for each of them for a more detailed explanation. And that enables the organizer to just see at a glance what you have to offer and then go for, for more information if that's what they want. Similarly, you could say, you know, here's my one sentence bio for a full bio click here. I'm a huge fan of links when it comes to sending pitches because it enables the reader to go as deep as they want to or to just look at the first thing and say, oh, yeah, that is definitely for me or that is definitely not for me. And to continue this theme of professionalism, you know, Michael has given some great advice on how to get those first engagements. And then I think it's how you conduct yourself in those engagements that paves the way mm -hmm. for more. You know, there are plenty of conferences that I've been able to be a speaker at year after year because I make the experience as good as possible <laughs> for the organizers. You know, if they if they need something by the first, I send it to them by the first. If they want a, a hundred word bio, I send them a hundred word bio. If they want the presentation uploaded to a Dropbox, I upload the presentation to the Dropbox. I don't say, well, you know, I already emailed it to you, so I'm not going to upload it to the Dropbox. No, right. you're just, you know, don't go to all the trouble of of finding and pitching yourself to the opportunities in your niche and then shoot yourself in the foot by leaving a bad taste in the mouth of the organizers by not complying with what they're looking for. I like that. I, I'm going to go out on a, I'm going to go out on a limb here and just say that there's always a prima donna at every event you go to. There's always somebody that's either they don't have their stuff together or they're difficult to work with. Don't be that person. And you will automatically, the organizers will appreciate you. <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. you don't want to be that person. Or either of those people. If right. you can do that, that's the bare minimum to either get yourself invited back or to get yourself, you know, spoken spoken about highly to other organizers. Because organizers do talk. So just avoid that advice or do, follow that advice. And it's just amazing what, what sort of things can happen in your career. And that kind of leads. So that's sort of like the uh, the pre and then the during. Uh, but then there's also an element in your book where you talk about it's not over. Once you step off the podium, right? Once you leave the podium, so let's talk a, a little bit about uh, that because you've got the beginning, the during, and then the and then the post. Yeah, well, yeah, I think the example. Step, go. Oh, go ahead, Michael. Go ahead, Maddie. You you take it first. Well, I was going to say that the example, the experience we had at Writers Digest, where um, we're having this great networking opportunity, we're chatting about uh, this opportunity to co-author a book. And then if we both went home and um, moved on with our lives without ever looping back on that, then we would have never had a book and possibly a, another book um, in the works. So acting on those connections that you're getting is key. Okay. All right. Yeah. And, and also, once you step off the stage, answer people's questions. So often people will have questions after the opportunity. And spend the time to answer their questions, spend the time continuing to be a spectator and a participant in other, the other events of the, of the talk. Don't just be the speaker that shows up, gives your speech and then go, gets on a plane and goes home, you know, to the extent that you can avoid that. And then also don't forget to thank the organizer. So professionalism is, is everything. And from the moment you step on your plane, you have, you technically have to be on. Because you never know who's going to who who on that plane might be at the event you're going to, right? Yeah, and yeah. from from the you know you're really not off until you set foot back home. And so, <laughs> professionalism through and through. Maddie has brought it up several times. I bring it up several times. We we hammer it in hammer it in in the book until we're blue in the face because it's it's absolutely critical. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I can imagine there's a writer going to a conference to talk. I'm going to do a keynote on respect and treating others with respect. <laughs> and then you're on the plane and you are watching the person on stage talking about respect, you know, like dissing the the the, the flight attendant and complaining, like, and, you know, leaning back in their chair and annoying the person behind them and just being rude yeah. and belligerent. Right. And you're like, whoa, dude doesn't live by the, exactly. by the thing said on stage. 
No, it's true. People are always watching. So even when you're off stage, how do you how do you interact uh, and and act with people too? I think one of the challenges I I've had is at some conferences I'm scheduled back to back, and I have 15 minutes to get across whatever from the hotel from one one room to another room to set up with my laptop and get the tech ready for the poor tech folks who are trying to get everything ready and. And people want to ask questions. And I find it really challenging because that's where I usually say, okay, I'll be back after this. I'll be in this location if you want to chat with me there. Or if not, here's my you know, email me. I'd love to chat with you. Uh, I mean, if, if I don't see you here. I mean, that's always a really challenge for me whenever I have the lineup of people who want the one-on-one -on -one because they maybe didn't get a chance to ask or they were too shy to ask in front of everyone else. Yeah. I think that's a great tip. And if you know that ahead of time, you know, you're going to be running from place to place, then you can even say in your presentation, you know, as you're nearing the end of your presentation, you know, we're starting to run out of time and I have to run to this other place and I'm going to be at the cocktail hour or I'm going to be, uh, you know, eating lunch in the common lunch area or throwing open those opportunities that, you know, will be uh, available to people. Brilliant idea. I love that idea. Yeah. If, if you know that just at the very end, let people let people know that so yeah. so they don't think you're rudely rushing to get the heck out of there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So you guys have given us such incredible, valuable advice. The last bit of uh, the last thing I want you to share with my listeners is a: where can we find out more about each of you online, and where can we find this incredible new book that you've co-authored, Michael? All right. Well, you can find me online at authorlevelup.com. That is where um, you can find my books. Maddie? You can find uh, my fiction work at uh, maddiedalrymple.com. And you can find my nonfiction work at theindieauthor.com. And you can find from page to platform how to succeed as an author speaker at all um, fine online retailers in um, print, audio, AI narrated audio and ebook. Yeah, it's a bit of a, a, a link, but uh, books to read.com forward slash from page to platform is also a link to mm -hmm. I had to memorize that yeah easy enough oh well uh thank you guys so much I did, did have the honor of uh, getting early access to the book but this is definitely one I'm recommending to lots of writers out there thank you guys for hanging out with me today thank you Mark. thanks Mark have I mentioned how awesome I thought this conversation was. There's so many things to reflect on. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple things I, I really want to hone in on. One of them is directly related to this and another one sort of adjacent, but I'll, I'll get to that. This was a reminder. I, I, I was focusing a little bit more on the panels and, and the discussion we had about providing good, good value uh, as a speaker. And, and I think that's one of the things that really comes, really comes down to it. When I am a guest somewhere, and this could be a guest speaker who's there to deliver a keynote. This could be I am a, a speaker on a, on a panel or I'm delivering a presentation at a particular conference. The most important thing to me is making sure that I understand what it is that the audience is there for, or what it is that the conference or organizers are in need of, and making sure that I understand that and deliver on it. And deliver something that's going to bring value to the people there. That is my number one priority. And that's what I try to focus on. So I'll give you an example. It was the other day I was just on a, a podcast that my publicist had, had set up. And again, because I wear so many hats, it's a little bit more confusing for me when I'm booked on a podcast from a third party that I don't necessarily, <laughs> it's not something I set up, it's something someone set up for me. I don't necessarily know if I'm there as the horror spooky guy with a new book that I just have out, or uh, that I'm there as a book industry representative and is the audience readers who are interested in scary stories, is the audience readers who are interested, uh, or writers, for example, that are interested in the business of writing and publishing. And so the in, in the case of, of, of most recent uh, podcast appearance, it was a little bit of a combination of both. It was for writers, but also uh, because it was Halloween season, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of my spooky stuff. So I was able to adapt a little bit of the, uh, you know, the story and, and what's going on and what the book is and stuff like that, but then also adapt the business reasoning and the, and the, and the author marketing that went behind it because it's so, I think it's so important 
we can get, and, and, and this happens uh, all the time. I, I love, I love being up on stage. I love presenting. I, I love being able to, to provide entertainment, information, inspiration to an audience. But what's more, more important than anything is delivering what they came there to get. So for example, at my book launch the other evening, it was, you know, friends and colleagues and people who were already horror readers and then people who were just there to support me because because Liz had a, a bunch of her colleagues from work just there to show up and hang out and have fun but want to support me. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to provide a bit of a background. Okay, why this book? Why did I publish the original edition 20 years ago? A little bit about me being you know afraid of the monster under my bed and why I write scary stories because I seem like a nice guy, but why is, why is he so twisted? So I gave him a little bit of that and I constantly injected humor because I wanted to keep them entertained. I wanted to keep them not like bored, right? And I had a little visual slideshow that projected onto the wall behind me just to add some, some humor and mirth give them a bit of an insight into this weird writer's life. And then it was very quick. It was basically five minutes, maybe eight minutes of that. And then I did very, very brief readings. And what I did is I selected some really short pieces from uh, from the book, uh, but some poetry, which is very short. I, I, I did one that was a little bit more literary and... Um, uh, contemporary poetry, more of a philosophical look at uh, uh, just the, what it, what it's like to be a writer. And I thought that would be interesting for, for some of the folks. Then I did some dark humor pieces, you know, to get a laugh. And then I read a very short story that is one of the ones that's meant to be read around a campfire. And so again, I can do that with um, with conviction and and get people going because it's like it's like I'm telling a ghost story, and I ad- imagine ask them to imagine we were all sitting around a fire, and I'm telling this story, and that's how I did that. But again, very brief. I think the whole the whole part of me talking was maybe twelve to fifteen minutes because. They were there, everyone's at their own tables and talking and having beer and and just catching up and having a good time. And it was about them being there, having a good time. Yes, I signed books and I talked to people and wandered around and was a bit of a social butterfly. But my focus was making sure, A, they enjoyed the beer, (laughs) they had a good time. So I did not want to talk too long and bore them. Not that I'm boring, of course. I think I'm rather I'm I'm rather riveting at times. <laughs> but I also recognize that there were some people there that were fans who wanted to see what I was uh, what I was doing and, and and get you know interested in the book. But then there were some other people who were there just to show their support. So I didn't want to I didn't want to tax their patience as well. So again, I try really hard to be conscious of that. And maybe as, you know, Becca Syme from a previous episode talked about that I'm high uh, empathy and potentially that high empathy helps me, helps me in that aspect because I, I look at what's there and what I can deliver. And I think if we approach those, uh, those appearances, those panelist opportunities, et cetera, with, with that attitude in mind, it probably will lead to our success because you'll be able to deliver. And that leads directly, obviously, to you and your books and the books you write. When you think about what it is you're delivering to the ideal audience and the ideal reader, it's the same thing. I love when I love when we can tie all those things together. The last thing I want to reflect on is, is Maddie herself. And I am so in awe. I, I, I received an email this morning from, from Maddie that I haven't had a chance to get to because I'm behind in getting uh, the podcast done. But I'm just so impressed with how brave and how willing to try and willing to ask and willing to reach out that Maddie is. And and I recognize that you do not get the brass ring if you don't reach. And since I've known her, it's one of the things I've admired the most. I mean, Maddie and I co-authored a book because she reached out and, and she w- wanted some information from me and I gave it to her. I, I did a special episode of the podcast because I, she said, hey, this would be a good idea. I'd love to hear this. So I'm like, yeah, let's do it. I'll do an episode on it. And then she came back to me and said, you know, we could put this into a book if we worked on it together. And I was like, hey, yeah, it's a good idea. Let's do that. So, I mean, I know that we, we make our own opportunities sometimes and Maddie is so amazing and, and, and again, brave, because I'm not good at doing those sorts of things, reaching out and, and, and trying and asking for things. And I know I can learn from somebody like Maddie. 
who does those things. And similarly, Michael shared a similar story about just saying, hey, you know, I haven't really spoken to a big group before, but I'm going to put together this thing. I'm going to show you what I'm capable of based on, you know, my YouTube channel and all the other stuff I did. And of course, he also knocked it out of the park. So again, if there's that thing that you're thinking that oh, I, would, I wouldn't mind trying this, I wouldn't mind doing that. It doesn't have to be speaking. It could be anything sort of related to it. And people could say no. I mean, perhaps... You know, me having me talking to Graham uh, at, at Counterpoint Brewing about, hey, do you, do you think we could do a tie-in beer? What would it cost? Like, how much, how much would it cost? What would it cost me to do this? And sit, we sat down and we hammered out the idea. And and obviously, I wanted to look for a win-win situation where he could make money off of it and I could get opportunities for marketing and promotions. But again, I'll talk more about that in that next solo episode that's coming up. But that's it for my rambling reflections for this episode. Uh, what is it that you, when you were listening to Maddie and, and Michael, what was it you were thinking of? What was it that you were reflecting on? I'd love to hear that. Of course, you can leave comments at starkreflections.ca and various other ways you can get those comments to me. Love to hear that. And, and finally, as I promised earlier, this story bundle that I talked about in the promo, I have... A few codes. So yes, it's available. It's a great price. You can get access to it. But for my patrons, for the awesome folks who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash darkreflections, I'm trying really hard to give you guys some extra stuff. Remember in last episode, uh, for Canadian authors, obviously, I, I, I offered the opportunity to, to get in on to get in on some promotions with uh, the Indi Indi Canadian Independent Publisher Magazine with uh, Andrew as well. But this time I, I've got some codes. I have three codes that are available for you to get the, the first four books uh, in the bundle. And uh, I, I think there's an option. You can opt in to get all of them, and I'm not sure how much extra you have to pay, but it'll be explained on the page. But at the very least, I've got some codes, and I thought, why not give them to my patrons? Because there's four great books that are available. So I will create a form. And uh, patrons, uh, don't worry if you're listening to this episode right away. I probably am not going to have the form ready <laughs> until the October 5th or 6th or something like that. And there'll be a forum where you can indicate, yes, I'm interested in the codes. And I mean, if I only get three people who ask for the codes, well, I'll go to those three people. And if I get more than three people, then I'll just put you guys in a random draw. And the way I do the random draws is, again, I've got three levels of patron, uh, three levels of paid patrons, I should say. And the, um, you know, you get a vote, one vote or two votes or three votes, depending on uh, the level that you're in. And that just increases your chances to win because I want to make this stuff available to everyone. But I also want to thank those who are investing a little bit more uh, because I want to, you know, give, give you uh, more opportunities as well, because I appreciate you guys so much. Uh, and your support does actually mean the world to me. It actually softens my heart. And, and I appreciate that. But of course, I appreciate all my listeners. You're awesome. Thank you for listening. Thank you for letting me bend your ear yet again, and letting me share some of these amazing guests that I have on the podcast. But as I said, that is it for this episode. That is it for this week. Until next week and until next episode, this is still, I am still, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. And I am still wishing you, dear listener, oh, you know where, you know what's coming. I'm wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.